Our session this afternoon is Meet Your Data. Uh, and it's fitting that this is where we're starting out. So underpinning all the work uh, if, that is at the heart of institutional momentum work is data. From understanding what is working, uncovering areas where we are still struggling, we look to data to get us a clear picture of how our students are succeeding and how our students are maybe struggling. Data can help us understand where specific communities are not being served, where we are on the path to meeting our goals, and where we need to build a sense of, how we can build a sense of urgency around what we are trying to do. Data is truly at the heart of what we're set out to do with the momentum approach. Uh, today, we're gonna to talk with two institutions and uh, somebody from the system office, Angie Bell. All of these are actually good friends of mine, people who have uh, had a great opportunity to work with over the years. And they've done a great deal of work over the last couple of years in really digging into their data and understanding how they can use their data more broadly on their institutions. So I'm gonna, there's some time set aside today. Uh, you'll, have, you'll have time throughout the day to put questions in the chat if you like. Uh, as we go, each person, each group will ask, answer questions at the end of it, but there's also a chance for us to gather together a bit more briefly in smaller groups at the end of the, uh, at the end of this uh, sort of conversation and then to come back and ask sort of more of our questions. So as, as we go forward, I'm just gonna go ahead and introduce the speakers and then I'm gonna hand it off to them. We're joined today by Gene Van Sickle. He's the Assistant Vice President of Strategic Student Success Initiatives and uh, Holly Verhasselt, uh, Associate uh, Provost for Institutional Effectiveness, both of them from the University of North Georgia. We're also joined by Michelle Roseman. She's the Vice President for Student Engagement and Success at Georgia Gwinnett College, uh, in wearing the green, which I believe is the contractual obligation. Um, and then uh, we'll, later on, we'll also hear from Angie Bell, who's the Vice Chancellor for Research and Policy An Analysis at the University System Office. But today we're gonna start with University of North Georgia. North Georgia. So Holly and Jean, I'm gonna hand it over to you and I'm gonna stop sharing so you can start sharing. Uh, there we go. All right, uh, thank you, Jonathan. All right, so. Um, again, I'm Gene Van Sickle, and um, I mainly work with um, student success efforts at our institution. And it's that lens that I want to begin um, our discussion of uh, how we use data. Uh, I think it's important for you all to know that right, the confines in which I right, uh, rely on data are um, all around student success. I'm the liaison for the institution for things like gateways to completion. Um, I also uh, work a lot with Jonathan around the CCG data uh, that our poll question was on. And so I depend very heavily on data. And so I'm gonna start off by just uh, describing a little bit about two ways uh, I use data. One is as a user of data and the other will be um, how I use data to tell the story. All right, so uh, as a user of data, uh, data is very important for uh, our work around student success because we need it or we rely on it to help us identify uh, gaps in equitable outcomes, for example. Right? And as you all know, that's a key focus of the momentum approach uh, within the USG. Uh, that is also critical to our CCG strategies. And so data um, is critical in informing uh, what we do at an, as an institution uh, around um, closing equity gaps. So um, asking for data is not about finding uh, problems, right? That need solutions. That's not the, the approach that, that I tend to take uh, or that I think we should take. The data is part of assessing what we're doing, right? As an institution to close these gaps to ensure um, that, that our students are successful. Uh, data is how we monitor the institution's serving of students. We have many needs, we have finite resources, uh, and the data can help us identify opportunities where we can address the needs uh, that are often fluid, uh, especially when we look at it from one year to the next. And one way to cope with that fluidity uh, is to integrate information provided through data uh, and, and to weave that into our institutional culture. And so the first thing I wanted to just mention here as a, a quick example, one of the things that our institution has done over the last few years, uh, and this was part of our QEP, is we've been assessing student learning uh, in relation to uh, advising. 
Uh, in particular, uh, this aligns with the momentum approach because of the emphasis on pathways, clear purposeful choice. Uh, the, 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 what we did a couple of years back uh, of integrating career uh, information into that uh, process and then helping students uh, to identify uh, a plan, an educational plan uh, going forward. But we've been assessing how well students have learned through that process. And what we found is that uh, they are learning how to do this better and how to do it on their own after a couple of semesters. They do make progress after a few semesters. But also we'll tie this to one of our other focuses um, uh, within CCG. Uh, we have seen a, sled, a steady uh, decrease in excess credit hours at graduation over the last five years. Right now, I'm not saying that that is a result of our QEP and emphasis on advising, that is certainly a part of it. But when you put all these things together in the way that Dr. Denley was talking about this morning, uh, we are seeing uh, the convergence of all these efforts produce the results that we had hoped to see, right, in uh, reduction in excess credit hours. The second thing I wanted to, to talk real quickly about was um, how we use data to tell our story. Um, data helps us identify uh, what we do well. Uh, and I, I'm reminded, um, as I see in my provost on camera, um, she likes to talk about, right, this business approach uh, of capitalizing on the things you do well. And that's one of the ways that we want to use data, right, is to capitalize on the things we're doing well. How can we scale it? How can we, right, move that across the institution? We have five campuses after all. And so data can help us do that. Data can also help uh, us disseminate that information to our stakeholders. But more to the point, uh, data helps us identify ways to apply those approaches uh, to other areas. And I want to give the example of gateways to completion. Uh, we are all participating in that process as well. And that has been a particular challenge over the last year, especially. Uh, and the data has been um, uh, scattered, I guess I'll say. Uh, but what's the bright spot? The thing that we noticed in looking at our data over the last uh, three semesters around gateways to completion work is we have made progress, right? We are doing something well when it comes to gateways to completion uh, courses, right? Uh, specifically, uh, math is the example I wanted to give just quickly, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Holly for a further investigation uh, of data. Um, if we're focused on closing equitable gaps, right? Um, gateways to completion is a good example of this. Among African-American students, what we've seen since we started, uh, we piloted first time in fall 2019. Our historical DFW rate for African-American students in college algebra was 34.4%. In fall 2020, it was 25.2%. It's not where we wanna be. We can do better, we know we can do better, but we've moved the needle in a way that tells us we're doing something right. And so now the question is, how do we do more of that? For Hispanic students, we see similar trend uh, in college algebra. Historically, our DFW rate there was 27.6%. In fall 2020, it was 20.95%. Again, not where we want it to be, but we're making progress. We are seeing better outcomes for those students that we serve. And I'll add one more just quick statistic here for you as we look at this. So Hispanic male students uh, in that college algebra course historically was 30.1%, but in fall 2020, uh, we got it below 20%. It's now at 19%. So, um, that's a positive story that we need to tell about what we're doing uh, to change um, the trajectory for students uh, in those gateway classes. As Dr. Denley mentioned this morning, success in that first math class is so critical uh, for what happens afterwards and sustaining that momentum. And so we've made a deliberate effort in that regard uh, to set our students up for success and what the next course will be. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Holly 
to discuss more of how we use data. Molly? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Jean, for setting that up. Um, my name is Holly Verhasselt, and I'm uh, the Associate Provost for Institutional Effectiveness here at UNG. Um, I joined UNG and the, the University System of Georgia about two and a half years ago. So um, listening to folks talk about the momentum approach and Complete College Georgia, um, even uh, when Jean mentioned our QEP, uh, all of those things were underway sort of long before I thought about moving to Georgia. Um, so what I was planning to focus on this morning is just the idea uh, that Jean emphasized of using data to tell a story. And I, I really think it's the story part that should come first. And then the, the data part um, in some respects follows after so that you're not on, on a fishing expedition. And um, one of the things that I've emphasized on our campus is the idea of, of data literacy. So that in order to make data informed decisions or data supported decisions, um, you really have to be able to understand how to create and request data, um, how to analyze and understand results, and then how to use that information to better support your decision making. Um, I don't like data driven because I don't think data should ultimately be the driver in what we do. Um, Rather, data is a tool that can help us uh, reach our goals. And the, the goal is really what we're after, whether we're talking about um, the momentum approach or talking about Complete College Georgia, or if we're talking about student success in sort of this um, broader context. You know, we want students to have better course completion rates, higher graduation rates, because those are the things that um, get them out into the workforce. Um, so thinking about, um, you know, creating or requesting data, um, depending on your institution, you may have access to dashboards, you may have access to an IR office, you may have access to a team of, of data analytics people. And so, you know, finding the right people or the right resources on your campus is, is one part of that, um, that process. But really, when you get ready to, to ask a question, you really want to think about what is the benefit of that particular set of information to your institution or to students or in helping faculty or in helping staff um, accomplish their jobs. Um, because we want, we want data to be a useful living thing, not something that is generated into a report and put on a shelf and, and filed away. Um, I'm sure many of you have had experiences where you write the report, you submit the report, and then it, you never hear from it again, but you've checked the box and, and you go on. Um, and then a lot of work went into that without a lot of return benefit. Um, I want you to think about um, also in terms of making those requests um, carefully about what the definitions of data might be. Um, on our campus here at UNG, we have five campuses. We offer everything from certificates to doctoral degrees. So just thinking about, well, give me the student's home campus. Well, is that the campus they applied to? Is it the campus where they're completing most of their hours? Oh, hello? Nope, sounded like someone was asking a question. Um, so think carefully about data definitions so that you're comparing apples to apples about, um, comparing apples to apples when you're having data discussions across campus. Um, you'll also want to think about what's trends or what are trends in your data and what is just noise. Um, working with the Institutional Research Office here, sometimes I feel like we need to put a big asterisk next to anything we report to 2020 um, because it's been such an unusual year. And so kind of starting to think about what's, what's meaningful and, and what may be due to sort of outside influences. 
So um, I like to think uh, of campus resources and, and the data request, thinking about um, uh, Dr. Denley's example of baking a brownie this morning. I like to think of data as, as being like the egg in the recipe. It's, it's the binding ingredient that keeps everything else together. Um, I cook a lot. This is probably a cheesy example, um, but I'm going to run with it. Um, and so that, that request should really be aligned with your outcomes. It should be geared towards analyzing progress towards that outcome, or sometimes identifying the type of equity gaps that are so important to the momentum approach. Um, and then it should be used to inform next steps. So, so when you analyze that data, um, you know, it's not so much is it statistically significant, but is it something that is meaningful and useful and relevant to your campus? And what that threshold looks like is going to vary depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and so when you report out, uh, is the goal ultimately to expand a service, to uncover equity gaps, um, to evaluate the success of an initiative um, or to allocate or shift resources around uh, because ultimately for these things to be successful we need to be able to support them and and those can be difficult decisions to make um, i always encourage people not to start out with a conclusion and then draw the data down trying to find support for that start with it the way you would start with a research question. Now, what is it that you're hoping to do or to learn or to evaluate? Um, and in that respect, when we're informing decision-making, context is everything. And so um, the, the best data analytics tool, the biggest Excel spreadsheet, um, the, the best written report, it can't replace the human factors behind understanding the context because if we all made the same metric on our campus, it would mean very different things within the scope of um, our operating environments in, in different areas, different service regions with different student populations. And so I always try to have people think of data as a tool. It's not, not the silver bullet, it's another way to approach um, problem solving and decision making on campus. So, um, I don't know, Jean, is there anything you want to add? Or we? Uh, not at this time, no, Holly. Okay, so Michelle, I think, think you're up next. Okay, fantastic. Um, let's see here. I'm going to try to share a, a slide to help tell our story here. Um, and what's really neat is, like my colleagues have said, shared, is that, um, you know, the, the data, let me see, okay, here we go. Um, the data differs by campus, although we're all trying to achieve the same goal, uh, completion, retention, and, um, and, and quite a few, uh, you know, goals, but we, we organize our data differently, and that's fine. Uh, so, Walking you through here again, Michelle Rose, my vice president uh, for student engagement and success, and had to learn an onboard really quickly as I arrived here last January throughout the pandemic. But it's been an amazing journey to uh, bring a lens that allowed to see all the pieces here. Um, and, and, and our approach on, on learning on da the data here, for me, it's about data management. Uh, one of the things I was challenged to do very early is also learn about where does the data live? And uh, once we discovered where it lives, how might we organize a data sharing tour for continuous conversations with our colleagues and then also uh, student success? Uh, what does that data say that's trending? And is there data around uh, the pandemic and the implications for st students, faculty, as well as staff as we design our retention ecosystem? It's always a question that you'll find that the data actually creates more questions, right? Uh, so making uh, sense of the data on the campus, um, it, it really is, uh, you got to know where it lives. The, the large volumes of data, you know, like my colleague Holly says, 
you know, we don't collect data for the sake of collecting the data, but how might that data get organized across the layers of the institution? How, how, how it might get organized in the School of Business may differ uh, for the School of uh, Liberal Arts and, and beyond, but are there some themes that are trending uh, but it was really fun. It's kind of like I look at this picture here. It's like my colleagues were all over the campus and you have to almost encourage folks to be okay. I love to use the language demystifying data. How do we make it safe for our colleagues um, to be okay sharing their data and not judge it? So part of it too on any campus, uh, I would recommend as a, you know, for big, going from big picture and we use the word drill down, is an inventory. The inventory of your data is very essential. Um, what, what's already been collected and how has it been used? Uh, we both talk about the goal that the data should be a continuous living prod product. Um, it's about assessment and then uh, working with stakeholders for uh, creating change. Uh, but most importantly, it really is a chance. I found it here at GGC is to continue to build partnerships uh, with different groups on campus and which data sets are they most in, uh, motivated by, uh, which led to various innovative approaches uh, for organizing the data. Because when you're saying colleagues and stakeholders, you know, colleagues feel a little better to me. Uh, the reality is uh, that energy is also what helps you continue to, to work together to identify, okay, what kind of innovation can we do uh, those partnerships are in, important. Uh, and the bullet point number five, the spirit of collegiality. I find that again, people know uh, or own different parts of the data and, and um, just to hear them tell their story uh, then also augments the, the story also from our institutional research area. Uh, one of the things that uh, pr uh, pr uh, priorities I was able to put in place uh, working again, having worked closely with colleagues um, from listening sessions. Uh, we had a fall 2020 data sharing tour as well as a spring 2021 data sharing tour. That's where whether you, if you had housing data and you shared what it is that you collect in terms of analytics or even uh, you know, SLA data in terms of retention, is there a need for a new interdisciplinary degree? How might that data continue to um, identify where we can close gaps. Uh, faculty also presented, for example, on online readiness. We had to pivot very quickly in April of 2020 uh, into the online format. So we collected data all throughout that process to um, make continuous improvements. Um, and, and so we, we continue uh, typically every Friday from noon to one or one to two where these connections, we come together and foster conversations around data, making it safe. I like to word demystify data because, you know, again, it's, it's like common. It's like, you know, like, like you breathe. Uh, together, faculty and staff discover new insights on these Fridays. And most importantly, our faculty involvement is really critical and key across the schools. Uh, but again, it does create that safe space. And uh, we have pretty good turnout, great topics. Um, and most importantly, that data gives us a chance to take a look at uh, what's trending. Uh, again, the data set also is um, helping us build a more robust retention and completion ecosystem. I always like to say, you know, it's beyond iPads data. It's actually drilling down across the student life cycle, understanding how the first years are being retained and who's not um, into the sophomore year, the junior year, and the completion and beyond. Our ecosystem, especially this year, actually had to include the recent alumni and how they're faring into today's labor market. But for example, um, excellent partnership. Uh, we work with um, uh, Carl Benson Institute. We have a new grades app where a lot of our data has been um, looked at to say, okay, how do we organize these views for members of the provost's office, for the deans or for student engagement and success? We also have a new app coming out in terms of uh, transfer student data. We, we can see our students, a collective word leaving, either going to USG or maybe going to another school, 
So we wanted to optimize that information and then how can we create new degree programs to actually incentivize our students to complete with us. Although we are happy they're completing with another USG, that data is already starting to show us trends too, but it also gives us insights about what's possible here on, at the institution. What's fascinating too is when we think about data governance is, is dashboards across the continuum of the uh, ecosystem for the deans and then what encompasses student success data. As you can see here, Carl Vincent Institute, we've been working really close with them. Uh, I always say, look, recruitment data, you gotta know where the students are coming from GVC. What's really fantastic is different groups have access to this information and it inspires conversation. It informs orientation. It informs how students get placed in learning communities. And then most importantly, our newest one is the grades app that uh, a cadre of leadership is able to see how students are moving in and through uh, courses, DFW rates, STEM courses, learning communities. So these visualization tools um, add also to the conversations. So there has to be a multiplicity of approaches, uh, like my colleagues have said, uh, the dashboards are great, but you can't replace the human factors, which is conversations and lots of listening sessions. Um, I like this little image here on the side, again, um, coming in here. Uh, what was really neat is I share it folks, you know, you might be amazed at what you discover simply by looking at things from a different perspective. It's been my pleasure to come in and hear these different conversations around, well, Michelle, you know, hey, do you have data about, you know, who students, which students registered late for the fall? Uh, what implication could that have on their retention? What's happening to students who are stopping out? our overall stopouts, how might we see that differently? Students who are not returning from fall to spring and then the impact or students who don't, you know, who stop out, where stop out is a definition around, uh, I believe three semesters. We're also able to take a look at equity gaps in terms of completion, um, but expanding again, beyond the iPads data of graduation rates. Um, in the moment there, we're able to see also how the English 1101 and 02 uh, math 1101, 1102, how are our first years? What's trending? Uh, we use even D2L usage data in, a, in an era where we are on the platform, again, which is a very new model to our students who actually came here for a face-to-face -face experience. So how might D2L data begin to tell us how students are engaging or even disengaging from classes and how might that data get distributed across the schools uh, also looking at in terms of completion, uh, how does satisfactory academic progress impacts that and uh, which majors? So we can start seeing those trends. Uh, for confidentiality purpose, I blocked out all of our critical data. But for example, um, stop out. Now this was a new one. Sometimes like Holly said, you got to change the data definition. Again, stop out historically triggers a different type of definition for us. But in terms of protecting enrollment, we wanted to take a look at the students who actually was not registering as quickly as we wanted to uh, for the spring semester. So quickly my team started saying, I said, well, let's take a look how they're trending across the schools. You know, are they on scholarship? And if they're eligible, let's go back to the admissions. Let's go back to the schools. Then why aren't they returned? These are some wonderful conversations when you think of big picture and drilling down, you're able to have across communities to protect that space. We're asking questions around attributes. For us, we're starting to learn which GPA is likely to retain our student and at what place are they more likely to leave? Uh, which GPA? So in terms of attributes, right? Going from big picture we can, uh, to a small picture, who's likely to get retained and who's likely to leave. So this way student engagement and success as well as our campus partners can work together to start to begin uh, placing um, engagement activities in to reel them back. Cause we too want them to complete because that's where it really matters. We're starting to see for our, in terms of college completion and even momentum data, how are students faring 
um, when it comes to satisfaction, satis sat satisfaction in academic progress in terms of cross by schools and majors? And how might the advising staff be part of that and helping in, in these outreach as well as, well as working with um, the offices of financial aid within enrollment management? And with our goals to expand living uh, learning communities, uh, my senior AVP, Justin Jernigan, has been working diligently since 2017 to grow these learning communities and how do we move the needle here? And as you can see, again, uh, Jean talked about using the data to see progress. And as you can see, look how things are increasing as we're scaling. The, the next piece of data we're taking a look at and unpacking is, is looking at the momentum year and the concepts, breaking it down. Who is attempting for the first 30 year, hours in the, in the first year? Uh, who's completing English and math? And when are they doing that? So we are starting to get that data to take a look at that. We are able to start seeing how many students in totality and percentage by cohorts of the first year are actually doing that. And, and if they're not, how might we place different engagement activities um, all throughout orientation and up until school begins? Uh, we're also starting to see how if they're on scholarship, does that make a difference whether I'm more likely to take 30 hours or versus am I not? So the data begins to become a way of seeing the world differently and fostering conversations. Uh, throughout the pandemic, we also collected information um, from faculty, from staff and students. Uh, we have some preliminary findings that talked about, do they feel confident in their ability to complete their degree? And our students to some degree said yes. However, there are this data that also show while they said, I'm, yes, I'm, I feel complete, uh, I can continue, we're also measured challenges. Uh, one of our faculty, as a matter of fact, presented data on, on online readiness and even study habits. So again, the data is organized differently um, by campus and for different campus stakeholders. In terms of advising, how might that data create the interventions or engagement when advisors, professional advisors start meeting with students, how might you begin to track the number of visits and then correlate that with levels of student success? These are conversations we are beginning here. Uh, again, how might tutoring impact um, the completion of courses? We could see uh, popular courses in high demand are the ones listed here. And we're beginning to track that too. The number of sessions, um, to what degree does that equate uh, a higher levels of retention or better grades? Uh, but most importantly, what, what's really fascinating is that both qualitative and quantitative data go hand in hand. And around our campus is, is really pro uh, promoting uh, a coordinated care model. These are the amazing conversations we're having about how do we identify the high risk students and what do we do about it? The students who are medium risk and low risk. So this is one framework. It's not, uh, every framework will differ, but most importantly, when you look at student success data and a coordinated care model, one of the features I, I use here is always making sure myself and my team, the data is being integrated all throughout the ecosystem from the cabinet to the faculty, professional advisors and staff. Um, how might we work together um, to utilize that data to, to make some decisions and foster a more conversation? Uh, thank you. That concludes uh, my presentation. And what I wanted to share was examples about broad-based data management and how you might drill down to specifics activities on one's campus. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, Finally, I'm, I'm really uh, fortunate to have Angie Bell uh, join us. Angie, uh, I know was having, Angie lost all of her internet. So I'm hoping she came back and I believe she is here. Uh, there she is. Hey, Angie. I am. Yes, I'm here. Uh, is my screen showing? It is indeed. Thanks, Angie. Wonderful. 
Um, thank you. Uh, I head up the Research and Policy Analysis Division at the USG, and I just wanted to take a moment to make sure you are aware of some data resources that we make available across the system. One of those is um, through our Click Portal that is a collaboration with the Carl Vinson Institute that Michelle was um, talking about that they have a special collaboration with. Um, we have created a portal and my team has built apps to support Complete College Georgia. And um, as you can see, this is where when you get into the Click Portal, the different apps that are available, the ones I'm focusing on today are these four right here that all start with CCG. There's one on degrees awarded, enrollment, graduation rates and retention rates. And I'll just use the retention rates one as an example of um, what these apps are able to do. Let me get rid of this here so I have plenty of room. So the apps have multiple pages and the first one always has an introduction to what you're seeing in the app. The retention app, um, as you just when you first start opening it up, it's just gonna be default to being one year retention rates for the whole system for all degrees. And then you'll see a number of things that you can focus on either males or females, full-time or part-time, et cetera. Over here, you see the data for 10 years. On the left are whether a student was retained at the institution they started at. And on the right allows you to see the system perspective of whether a student might have left the initial institution, but then transferred to a second institution within the system for that second year. That's especially important for our institutions with an explicit transfer function. So we're sort of historically used to looking at our numbers at a high level, but the apps enable you to be able to let, break it down in a number of ways. So for example, here I can see for retention, we've seen increases since 2011 when our Complete College Georgia work, work began. Hey, this little blip in 2017, we're not real sure about, and this is the year the cohort entered and in increasing since then. So despite the pandemic, pandemic, the fall 19 cohort showed back up in higher numbers in fall 20 than the um, previous cohort, than any previous cohort has actually. If I break that down by full and part time, um, I will be able to see that my full time students are, are uh, maintained at a higher level, but both groups full and part-time increased. Similarly, by gender, my women are retained at a higher rate, and they actually had a higher increase this fall than men who barely had an increase, which is interesting. I can look at race, ethnicity, and of course, that's sort of hard to, to break out there, see all that, so I'm going to spread it out. And so I can see that, okay, here, up in here in red, the Asian students had the highest rates, but they had a decline this year, which is interesting and something that institutions might wanna look into. Again, this is for the whole system level, but you can drill down to your institution. I, um, I know that I'm interested in seeing what my, my black population has done and they continue to increase this fall, which is a really great thing to see. I'm also interested in how we're serving Hispanic students. So I might look at this purple line here and see that my Hispanic population actually had a decrease um, this, this past fall in their retention. I may wanna dig into that a little more. So let me back out of this and just go back to showing the overall retention rate. But I'm gonna go over here on this left-hand side where I can drill down on a particular population and look at just my Hispanic population. So there I see that decrease um, this past year but if I look at the, um, I can use these other little buttons to see, well, what's driving that? So here I see, oh, my full-time Hispanic students actually increased retention. It's my part-time students where there was a decline. I look at gender and I can see that my women's students were retained at a higher rate, my men a lower so. Um, we're already on one race, so I won't click on that one. We already are. Down here in my Pell students, this is a really interesting finding. We see that it's my non-Pell students in dark blue that had the decline. My Pell students, the retention remained the same. And with learning support, you we expect um, what we might expect to see is what we do and see that it's our learning support students that were retained at lower levels. So we can click across these things and drill further and further down into our population to see where exactly in my population I'm having um, I'm having retention issues or retention um, positive outcomes. This is just one year retention, but you can look further out to see how many are retained after two years, three years, et cetera. And it does accommodate make, uh, and count as somebody graduates, they aren't counted as not being retained. Within the app, you can um, 
a different view is just to be able to pull the data and you can download it by clicking on the table and download it to be able to, to play with the table, the, um, table yourself. If you're more of a bar chart person, like to look at a snapshot, you can do that. If you wanna compare across different groups, different institutions, uh, different groups of institutions, you can take these bar charts. And right now, this is all university system data, but I could say, I'm gonna do comprehensive universities and I'm not gonna, not gonna um, pick on an, any specific institution, but just, and now I'm gonna pull this for comprehensive universities, one year retention, full-time versus part-time, state universities, full-time versus part-time, and how their retention rates vary and um, be able to compare across that. But I could do any two institutions or one institution versus a sector, et cetera. And also different, do different populations um, over here as well. You can also do that comparison over a trend if you want to look at trend data, comparison different sectors, different institutions. So I really just wanted to show you the utility that is in these apps, those same type of drill down functionality and comparison ability is in the, the graduation rate, the enrollment rate, the enrollments, et cetera. Um, so you can use all of those apps to really drill down to these high level indicators of what's going on at your institution. And through drilling down in the populations, perhaps start getting into those, um, the question, those questions that Michelle was talking about of what are those um, leading indicators that might be driving some of the differences we see here in retentions and completions. So a beginning uh, point for conversations uh, at your campus. Um, I did, uh, if you are, have not seen these apps or do not have access to them, uh, the IR director at your school is where you gain access to them. Um, we have a limited number of seats per institution. So if you don't know who that is at your campus, you can reach out to me, angela.bell at usg.edu, and we could work about getting you access. There are a finite number of seats, but it doesn't keep you from say having that Friday afternoon meeting that Michelle is talking about and throwing this up on a screen for a group of people to look at and share it. And you can also print these out. If you find an interesting fact, you can print it out, send it to whomever you wish. Um, we are hoping in the future to be able to get these put out in a more public fashion so that it's not just limited seats to be able to, to view this data, but we hope that um, you will use it to the extent it's available now. Again, if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me or to my team. And um, in your breakout groups, I think y'all are thinking about other indicators you may wanna be looking at and uh, would love to hear back if there's other things that you would like my team to model and click, we would try to uh, be able to accommodate that. Um, I think that's all I had to share. Uh, Jonathan, thank you for the time to, to show off our apps and I hope that they prove useful for the institutions. And so Jonathan, I'll jump in to say, I mean, as uh, the different people have, uh, are working with a particular projects or programs, just to have access to how well those programs or projects are doing uh, comparatively at the institution. So it is likely that a few people are gonna have a broad access to the data and how to disaggregate all that information across the institution. But for program directors, for example, or people that are working with specific uh, projects to have quick access, a quick way in which they can uh, compare and see how their program is doing. Jonathan, Group 6 had a very rich conversation. Our, our colleagues from re, uh, Group 6, if you want to jump in, what was really neat is that there was a continuum of individuals in the room. Some of us knew, some been there for a while. Um, trends around how might we organize data for college completion in Georgia, uh, Complete College Georgia for adult learners. So we might incentivize them to actually uh, get one of our USG degrees as opposed to the very pricey, um, you know, um, online schools, um, you know, like Southern New Hampshire or Phoenix. I thought that was a really neat, how might we organize that data? Um, from one of our colleagues, they're measuring student engagement data, one other data dictionary, one more dictionary data they've added to their set was um, measuring student involvement by organizations. Um, and or organizations linked to their major and how might that um, create some outcomes. A real fascinating group and we love the puzzles. So Jonathan, if you design that puzzle, uh, bueno to you on that one. That, that puzzle tells it everything, easy to read and make sense of everything. I'll pass that along to the person who made the puzzle. <laughs> 
Uh, Jonathan, I, I just wanted to say two things. And I was in group 23 and um, uh, one of our members was the director of career services. And I thought it was a really excellent point that she made around the idea that we are obviously um, justifiably focused on retention and graduation rates, but we it would also be interesting to find out how our efforts are impacting career outcomes for students after they leave us. And I, I felt like, you know, I know that that seems the logical next step. So I, I thought her raising that right now was a really good point. And I did want to just ask the question about faculty mindset, if anyone had a good recommendation of a faculty mindset survey. Well, I know we do student mindset surveys, but I'm interested in the faculty mindset. Celeste, we ha we have some uh, some elements in the I think in the in in a survey that we might be if you'll if you'll email me I'll I'll look that up and send it to you because I think we do have something but I, I really appreciate actually really appreciate the uh, the connection to um, to to post graduation outcomes because again part of the thing is that student success really builds towards where do they land and how do they land where they want to land and are they successful in, 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 able, in their ability to navigate their post-graduation lives. And I think that's a, you know, the data on that is messier and that, but it, and it's also, you know, but it's also the goal for the students. So I really think that's a, a really, that is the next frontier. Hey, Jonathan, um, I don't know if you saw, but Holly posted a link for a mindset survey for faculty there in the chat. Uh, it wasn't actually a, a mindset survey, but there's a, a whole network of, of mindset scholars that have done work. Some of it's discipline specific, some of it's K through 12, um, but they usually post a lot of great work about, about or around mindset. So there may be something that is appropriate to your situation or um, that can get you started, <laughs> started down the path of, of selecting what you need. Thank you. And I just want to mention that the colleague was Diane Farrell. That's who made the comment about career outcomes. I want to give her her credit. Our group spent a lot of time talking about data integrity and um, ensuring that or dealing with challenges around that and then also creating buy-in among users um, to actually implement things or use data to, to make decisions around faculty and making changes in their courses, how to build greater buy-in among the faculty. But then there was the concern also uh, you know, across who has access to data, are they using it appropriately, do you have um, procedures or ways to make sure that that people aren't, um, you know, pulling cherry picking their reports and maybe putting things out there because you don't have clear data definitions. And so we talked around some of the work that that Holly mentioned that that we've been doing and other schools have done or, or where there have been hiccups. And that was a good conversation. Jonathan and our group, uh, this is Justin Jernigan at TGC. Uh, our group, we had a good discussion. Um, I feel like it, it, it built off of a lot of what was shared in the, um, the presentations. Uh, so we definitely talked about how, if any one area tries to do it all, it, it's, uh, we, none of us has the bandwidth in any individual office, but if we communicate across our areas, um, there's a lot more potential to be able to figure out where there may be gaps that we can help address. Other thoughts? So, so Drea, um, Drea Hardy has a comment in the chat. I just kind of want to respond to it. I think it's interesting. I think you're right, Drea, that we, we sort of, um, you know, students oftentimes don't know where they want to land post-graduation. Part of this is also about um, not necessarily uh, students starting out knowing their career, but part of the pathway, I think, is that sort of what does a student need to know? This is actually a conversation that comes up later this 
this week, maybe about uh, pathways and also sort of this idea of connecting to careers. Like, so we don't expect students to, so I would, again, part of my, my pitch here is, and this is sort of the, there's something to come here is like the way in which we begin to onboard our students, gets them thinking about their careers, but also part of the process that we bring students on board, this conversation we've had years past about uh, you know, sort of informing a student of something, helping them discern that, having them affirm it and then repeating that cycle is something that they move through academically and then into their careers and in and, and, and personal lives. And so it's just an opportunity to sort of make sure that they, um, they, they get equipped with the skills that they need. And so that's it. But, Pulling it back to the data, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm wondering, Deepa, I mean, you're, you're noting here about students with learning support courses, um, but I'm not sure what you're responding to there, but I'm assuming there's a degree of, uh, that I skipped a, a, a thing. Can I call on you to, to talk? Uh, yes, hello everyone. Um, yeah, I was discussing with Angie, you know, we were trying to uh, look at data to see how many students complete uh, English composition one as well as composition two within the first 30 hours. So I was, you know, just saying that's a very tedious effort because we have to go student by student and then look at comp one, see how many pass, then look at comp two if the same students pass composition two. And I was wanting to know if there's an easier way to do that. And also keeping in mind that, uh, you know, there are students who are in learning support. So we would also have to figure out how many students who were um, in composition as, as well as in the core class were able to complete the two courses within 30 hours. So I was just talking to Angie to see whether there's an easier way to do this because you know we are trying to decipher this on our campus and realize it's a very um, tedious effort have, would have to be done student by student, course by course, semester by semester and track like a cohort across. So Angie said they're trying to do something at the UHE level, and then she would help us to figure it out. Yeah, I'll chime in. Um, this is Angie. We historically have been able to say how many students that are in learning support complete you know, complete their gateway English or complete their, um, their math. We've had more challenges around all students because we weren't able to see if incoming freshmen perhaps brought in uh, at the system level to see if students um, got credit via uh, AP courses or took dual enrollment at a non-USG institution and so we're, we're we're building in capacity through our academic data collection to be able to collect that information um, relatively soon so we'll be able to report to, to do that type of tracking um, relative relatively soon um i would say for the for the next fall cohort we should be able to start looking at that um we do run reports already just on learning support students but we don't surface them like in an app or anything we just run, sort of run a static report and i, I was telling deep i'm not sure I, I know that system office personnel have those but i'm not sure if they're being distributed to campuses or not so we'll, we'll look into that and um uh ho hopefully can address that for you Thank you. You're welcome. And Andy, along the same lines, you know, data for tracking students taking three courses in the focus area. So the three focus courses or courses in the focus area, they vary, you know, major by major. And, you know, we don't have access to EAB, you know, we don't have that license. So again, um, doing that kind of tracking, you know, is uh, um, pretty, pretty tedious and there's room for a lot of errors. And that's why I brought it out to see if there's anything at your level um, that could help us. That is a hairier beast. I'm gonna have to defer that question and get back to you on it. Sure, thank you. <laughs> but I, I took it down. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. muted. Interestingly, spacebar usually works for that. So thank you for that, Deep. I appreciate it. And thank you for Angie for the uh, phrase Harrier Beast. Um, and and I, so again, and, and, and this is where I think going back to the data integrity conversation that uh, that, uh, you know, about what does the data mean and having very clear definitions about what is a what we can know in that data and what we maybe don't know about a course that's in your focus area is one of those things that we just have you know, we're, we're building the definitions uh, even as we go. So um, if there are other questions, um, um, 
happy to entertain them. I want to take a moment just to make sure that we, we do thank our uh, virtually thank our, our, our speakers, Jean and Holly, Michelle and Angie. I think there's a there's actually a clap. Yes, there's clapping. I'm going to clap. Um, but thank you all for that. I really appreciate your, your work on that. If, if there are no further questions, I'm going to return exactly five minutes of your afternoon to you. And I really want to thank you for spending this first day with us. It has been uh, it has been exciting, uh, to say the least, and it's been gratifying that we had so many folks show up and stick around till the end. If there are questions that came up, if you shoot them to me out and, and you want to sort of ask them after the fact, um, shoot them to me and I'll pass them along to our, our presenters. Um, this video is, will be archived. You'll be able to watch it uh, at, at, at your leisure probably shortly uh, tomorrow, maybe the next day. So uh, know that. And, and I will say this, if you have colleagues who are not able to get into the event, let them know that too, because there were a number of folks who were just unable to get in. So uh, again, thank you so much. If there's anything uh, along the way that you think we can do better with respect to the, the summit, I really do appreciate your input on it because it really would help. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your afternoon and I will uh, see you hopefully tomorrow. Bye now.